diving straight to the issues. Uh, on my right, we have YB Senator Gan Ping Siu, who is the Deputy Youth and Sports Minister, and also uh, MCA Vice President. Next to him, we have Tan Sri Hasni Aga, who is the Chairperson of the Suhakam Human Rights Commission, and before this, led a very illustrious life in diplomat the, the diplomatic service. And at the end, we have Harris Ibrahim, a prominent uh, civil rights activist and former president of the Malaysian Civil Rights Civil Liberties Movement. Okay, to get the ball rolling, uh, to Tan Sri Hasni. <laughs> because we're going by age. <laughs> <laughs> seniority, seniority, you know. Malaysia. Tan Sri, uh, your commission, while standing for human rights, has often, fairly or unfairly, been described as a toothless tiger. Why do you think this is so? Thank you very much. A bit of an introduction to the question also. Uh, well, to be frank with you, uh, from my perspective, uh, you're worse than the toothless tiger. We are a toothless watchdog. <laughs> At least, uh, I've said this before, uh, my first press conference in Cuba. Same question. Uh, see, uh, you're a tiger. Uh, a, a tiger, even the toothless one, will, will frighten the beholder of our people. <laughs> Especially before it opens its mouth. Uh, but a watchdog, <laughs> uh, we can only bark. But barking is important. Uh, uh, but probably some, the watchdogs are normally leashed also for protection of other people. So we are not really uh, uh, leashed up, we can also just bark. No? But I think it's important, uh, barking itself is important. Uh, we are a watchdog uh, created by government to, to be a whistleblower, to monitor what's happening in terms of human rights in the country. And from time to time, whenever, whenever the occasion arises, we bark, we make signals. Uh, this is one of our missions. This is why I said, uh, I think over the last two years or so, uh, I uh, signed all the statements issued by Sovereign, except for some of the bad things. Uh, in the past, uh, <laughs> they, they used to be uh, signed by a group of commissioners, yeah, recently checked. Uh, except for the first time in uh, the Musa was the first chair being formed in the EBA and took to the media and whatnot, you know. So much that for a long time but now, people think that the Musa is still his own sort of because he made such an impact. Uh, so uh, we decided that it's better if the chair can be all statements. Uh, so they have the chief watched out about. So I do mark. To the extent that sometimes I'm perceived to be, uh, first, this is unfriendly to government, and now, uh, we often, I suddenly see a block for uh, dinner time. And now, as chairman, so I'm in the block. And many times I see views from the other side, those who are opposed to what Sokka is doing, as being anti government. Actually, you know, this way, I spent 42 years defending the government progress, the government. Could I be any any person, you know? Uh, but it's all wrong. So we bark. Uh, but we hope that uh, we could turn to a tiger uh, with him. Uh, this could be done by a uh, process of empowering for over the years. We look at other uh, national rights institutions uh, called the for NHRI. Uh, we are actually uh, what is called commissions or committees in some cases, or almost in some other uh, Some have a lot of powers. Uh, the way they get appointed, running by parliament, for instance, in our case, we have a committee. Uh, but we hope that maybe one day, when the process uh, opens, you know, by the parliament committee. Uh, and then uh, funding, directly from parliament, we are funded through the province of Parliament. No problem, you know, they do the same thing. But it's better, certainly, perception wise, if you're funded from Parliament. And this actually process of equity Parliament, you know. Uh, and also to bring uh, some cases to court in some other commissions like in Malaysia, 
Thailand, Philippines, uh, Australia. Uh, the human rights mission of the scientists can bring uh, selectively uh, latent issues of human rights uh, violation uh, to the court. Uh, we, we are discussing the intention as to whether or not this must be forward. The AG in this informal consultation says, well, uh, it's still too, he has not thought about it, but he said, think of this. If you want to bring cases to court, you can think uh, more ways. Uh, second, well, in that, that I, 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 I responded to him by saying that, well, we can have uh, lawyers who give, give, give pro bono uh, for service. This won't be up there. And there are lawyers now who are prepared to be some time uh, to fight for violent cases. And then said, what about if uh, you were to lose cases? Uh, you may have to pay. And uh, some experts told me that, no, that can be overcome by uh, amending the act in such a way that you provide immunity to Swaka. Now, what happens now? As commissioners, each of us individually performs the work uh, is immune from the law. Uh, unless Mr. Finn is like that. Now, if you're carrying your, your, you carry out your, your work, you can be brought to court. So, in the same way, this lawyer was saying, you can extend it to Swaka as an institution. Bring cases to court, and if you are to lose, no penalty of you. Because uh, so what is doing that performance is duty. I think this is a good suggestion. So we hope to, to be uh, more of a tiger. Uh, we have to leash somewhat. <laughs> but a tiger. Thank you very much. Thanks for the answer. Why me? Um, the government signaled earlier this week that they would repeal the Sedition Act and introduce something called the National Harmony Act. Okay? Now, what is this National Harmony Act? And uh, it's a much heralded move to repeal this Sedition Act, which many people feel, you know, sort of impaired their freedom of speech. How much does the government value freedom of speech? Okay, thank you. Um, just, just before answering about Sedition Act, things, perhaps I'll just comment a bit on what Professor just mentioned. I must say, since Swakam has been established since 1999, Swakam so, so has done a very good job. I appeared before Swakam before as a lawyer three years ago. Men of integrity and conduct the uh, hearing inquiry in a very professional manner. And uh, I, I take a view uh, governments recommend and appoint all the commissioners. There's no reason to question that the country you are against government. There's no such thing. There's no, otherwise, no, no reason to appoint you. And uh, all ministries involved who has been complained of should take what comes to advice seriously. That's how we get it. And I understand uh, the three last three is con contemplating to discuss the speakers. The, uh, the report by Swakam should be debated in Parliament. I think I'll welcome it also. Now, coming back to the freedom of expression, um, freedom of expression is an end starting. That's very fundamental. It's just like part of an essential part of individual freedom as against uh, state interference over your uh, right to expression. But it is also, there's also always a limit. In our constitution, for example, the new, the, the, the replaced Sedition Act, um, not to deter civilian, uh, adult, particular politicians to express and do not use that as a, as a tool uh, or even abuse it to, uh, to limit or to restrict uh, people having different opinions or uh, in particular from uh, uh, opposition parties. But on the other hand, there's always a limit. There's always a limit. Even with the uh, suggested, uh, the suggested uh, National Harmony Act, uh, there, are, there are certain uh, limits, there are certain bounds that are still off limits. Session 152, for example, the national language. There's no reason why we should question why national language, uh, past Malaysia, uh, someone suggests that it should be abolished, for example. This something is off limit. And secondly, 153, about the uh, special decisions, privileges, and all that, uh, it's written in the Constitution, and the sovereign's, uh, sovereign's uh, power. Another one, eight, only one, eight, only one, one, eight, two. So there are, there are, there are still certain limits that uh, whether into our society we want to keep that in. And uh, there, there are also some, uh, some reservations whether we should have limit at all. For example, like national language. National language, I think no one's going to question national language is translation. But what about the use of some someday someone suggests English to become another official language? 
or for that matter Chinese, or for that matter the Tamil or Kazakhstan or, or Iban language, to be included as one of the official languages. What about that? Would you agree that, that, that we should put a limit that we can't even raise that? Secondly, for example, like 153, <coughs> the special position. It's always been a very tricky when we talk about special positions, and the special positions as they seem to be uh, has become an established right, which which was not the case and which is not the case in any event. But are we here to question the special position? Now special positions, the mentions of uh, scholarship, quota, and uh, public service, all these are written in the constitution. And, but somehow, but the implementation part of it, should we question the implementation part of it? Rather than the letters of the words of special position. The implementation part of it, for example, it says quota must be implemented in reasonable proportion. Quota reserved for reasonable proportion. But what is reasonable proportion? This is something that we should ask. We can ask. Um, what if, in a certain uh, historical context, the Positive uh, affirmation, affirmation Act should be implemented for the Bunibutra in particular? in a certain percentage which is higher, say 50% or 30% or 20%, 10%, or it may come a time where this is no longer required. So what about the ro 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 royalty, the, the, uh, the, the sovereign rights? Are we going to, I'm sure there, there might be some people who believe in republics, uh, uh, republican, or make this as a republic. But this is the institutions and our constitutions, that is the institution of the nation, that we have a royal institution. Are you going to question that? To me, they, they are still a name and, and uh, unto all the things. Thanks, Harry. So to paraphrase the, the balance, and we need to be careful. Uh, Harry, I can see you itching your answer from that corner there. <laughs> Do you agree? Salam <laughs> Barusay. When when things start to go wrong in this country, the government pulls out its favorite bogeyman. Sensitive issue, don't touch. You cannot, you cannot ban the thinking mind. Now, why can't I suggest the abolition of Article 152? as an idea for discussion in a mature society. I think, with the greatest of respect, no ideas should be banned from the discussing table. Now, I'm very interested, I was intrigued that uh, Senator Gann opened with the matter of freedom of expression. Because, friends, technically this morning, I have committed an offence by wearing this t-shirt. The Home Minister last year, pursuant to his powers under the Society's Act 1948, declared per se 2.0 an unlawful society. And anyone who had in his possession any paraphernalia that purported to support committed an offence. Now, technically, you guys, the organizers, in giving you this platform with this, are aiding and abetting an offence under the Society's Act. Freedom of expression, illusory in this country. Sorry, Senator. We talk about the slew of legislative reforms. I say out the window and in comes the um, security offenses. Go into it in detail and you find we are gone from the frying pan to the oil oil.
to me, this uh, if I can if I can use this analogy, I use with the party party in my mass in the campo. Man is one free. In the early days, the pay days, payment days, what you needed to do was negotiate your space with your neighbor. Oi, you don't touch my wife, I don't touch your wife. <laughs> you don't touch my kids, I don't touch your kids. Early days, quite simple, negotiate the space. Then man made this fundamental mistake. He contrived to see all the nation state, convert the nation state with powers, and suddenly realized, hey, guess what? We better deserve some human rights laws or some basic rights. We have that in Article in, in part two of the Federal Constitution, Article 5 to 13, right to life. What does right to life mean? Freedom of expression, assembly. Uh, we have uh, the right of choice. Now, Article 11 to me is fundamental. Freedom of choice, the level of faith, what we profess. And this, with the greatest of respect, in my opinion, is what liberty is all about, the right to choose. In this country, that right is undermined twofold. One, a media that's muscle, a media that's controlled, so that the choices we make are to a large measure undermined by the information we receive. Number two, the right of legitimate dissent. But a sterling example. What did we demand? If reform to the electoral, the electoral process, that's a threat to national security. I think it's a threat to, to the government of the days, security of tenure. Thank you. Thanks, Harris, for that firebrand address and a bit of nostalgia about cavemen. I don't know what you're talking about, but colorblind, your t-shirt looks green to me. So, I don't see anything left. There's no lady in the back here. Okay, now you've brought up the juicy issues, the issues we really want to talk about. Freedom of press and ISA. So, Tansi Asli, I'll ask you, about the ISA, is it ever justified to restrict a person's freedom? Was it a mistake to repeal the ISA? Because I was told by a friend of mine that there's some people in the kampongs, for instance, you know, people who've had the ISA since, you know, time beginning for them, and uh, since, you know, the days of the communists, when it stood for a really good purpose, that they believe that um, when you release these people out, they're dangerous, and only, say, 10,000 people have been locked up under the ISA, they're dangerous and uh, some people have, you know, gone as far to draw a line with the increasing crime rate. Do you think there's cre credit in anything, in any of those suggestions, or you know, is limiting a person's freedom always wrong? Thank you for that question. Uh, let me say here that uh, Swakam is advocated for the review of ISA for as long as what well, it was created by the Swakam was in 1999. Uh, set up in 2000, you know, and since then, since, since uh, his first meeting, uh, it has called for the repeal of the ICA, or it is not possible yet for his amendment. And in 2003, uh, Sohaka had a uh, con conference uh, uh, with the civil society and all that other people to try to get ideas uh, on how to form or the ICA. And uh, we made a proposal to government, uh, as well documented. And uh, but nothing happened for so many years until recently. And when we were called by the Attorney General uh, for we thought it was a consultation power, oh, wow. but it turned out to be more of a briefing, <laughs> not much time for discussion, in which you see the, the draft uh, new law. Uh, I, I did make the point to him that I hope, we hope, in Swakam that it is not an issue of, uh, what do you call that in English, uh, saying old wine and new bottle, or new bottles, without this. Initially, the people were thinking that the ICA would be abolished and two new laws, two or three, uh, would be, would be uh, replaced and greater. But as, as it turned out, it's only one. So in any, in any case, so we made this point, and then to which she responded, no, 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 no. Uh, that's really surprised. It would be completely different, new. Refreshing. Uh, so we were quite, uh, I suppose, large group of places. But anyway, there's a briefing. Uh, in touch with certain points, uh, to which we reacted. Uh, but we expected a full consultation uh, with us and others, like that, about 
was okay. Other stakeholders, huh? but it was uh, not the case. You, you see what happens now, and there's a you know, public relation. Initially, uh, we all euphoric about it. Uh, I made a statement uh, praising the move, and to my surprise, uh, my statement was carried by the state sanitary regulations and carried the statement twice. So unfortunately, why? Uh, carried in my, not in my statement, but by my. Photographs there. <laughs> you know? Because people have been saying that SOCAM is a government agency or pro government. It's not very hard to say that we are not. We are not a government agency, neither we are we an NGO a commission. We are pushed between the two. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we, we had expected that uh, statements are taken all the media, including the mainstream pro government media, but uh, unfortunately it's not the case. No? Some will be here carry but not. But all the, I say, when the results came out, you know, we, we made certain uh, reservations. We welcome it, but we made certain reservations, and we use public knowledge, the public domain. And uh, we, uh, we were in with civil society. In terms of, uh, you know, if you were to reform it, to abolish it, then it must be a progressive step forward. No person should be detained arbitrarily. Uh, if you're detained, you should be tried in open court. Uh, and this is a combination of the, the Committee that came to Geneva you know, uh, on, on uh, unlawful detention. So we, we made this point, but uh, we hope that we'll continue to make inroads uh, with to the government to try to have a better uh, law uh, so that people will not be unnecessary. As, as uh, we, we share with the racism with all people that um, the law is now, the place is, uh, it's as tough, if not tougher than the last one, you know. So we will continue to play our role, uh, to talk with, I, I think it's important that we have to talk to uh, uh, members of parliament, uh, uh, lawmakers. So we have, we have uh, the advice of the Mahde and even Pala. Uh, engage with that of the police. But from my, uh, our perspective, the police uh, will not be able to change the law very much. They are uh, enforcement agencies. So every time we battle against them, they have the law. They are you know? So I, we are coming to the question that we have to talk to lawmakers. Uh, and you, civil society, young students, play a very important role. I'm very excited today to hear what uh, uh, Yama uh, to do that's it. And then you capture uh, the sense of the, you know, the optimism we have for the future. And I think uh, we'll be in very good hands uh, if the youth of today will play the role uh, as, as instigators or uh, to, inst to, to pressure the government to move forward for them. Uh, why me? As I said, you seem to respond. <laughs> no problem, I'll call on you. Feel uh, free to respond. Uh, about uh, Tan Sri's allegation that basically his assertion basically that the ISA was repealed and replaced with an act that's even stricter. So, okay, uh, if, if possible, I'd like you to answer why the end did something like this. Did they do it for political reasons or because there's no need for ISA anymore? Right, um, thank you. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of law students here. And I want to ask a very fundamental question. Would you or would you not agree with preventive laws? Now, that's a very fundamental question. You know, one of the first classes in the, in the legal studies is about rule of law. Try by appeals, uh, um, due process of law, go to court, and uh, presume innocence until proven otherwise. So, we have been trained all along that if anyone detained, put in jail without trial, or detained for, without trial, go through a due process of law, is not equality in front of law, and therefore it's wrong. All along, I would believe that. But let's, let's look at the very fundamental questions. The rule of law, rule of law, was developed in the 17th or 16th century. There was a, there was a time in the UK, for example, even from uh, the Europe, where the uh, arbitrary detention by the kings or the noblemen or people in power, and therefore there was this movement that the, any accused must be tried by his own peers, go through a due process of law, and there's no arbitrary detention. But time has moved on. Time 
is involved. We are dealing with the society change. Now we are dealing with the, some, I would, I would say in that case, some, some fanatics for example. Some extremists, if they are prepared to blow themselves up, disregard who are people around them, how are we going to prevent this? When I'm not saying, I'm not trying to justify that police should, are not doing their job, uh, give them a lot, a lot more powers, and so they can detain and, uh, for, for one reason or the other. And I also disagree that uh, uh, preventive laws should be used on civilians, reporters, journalists, or even for political dissenters or political uh, for politicians. That is so. And that is why my highest is repealed, replaced by the law, a shorter detention period, judicial oversight, that's very important, you can review and appeal, and uh, also the uh, uh, make sure there's no civilians or politicians or people, because holding, holding of different views and they will be detained. But we still have to ask very fundamental questions. Do we want to have a preventive law in Malaysia? Or against terrorists to begin with, for example? I'll give you some statistics. In, 19, in 2008, in 2008, about 68 detainees, IS detainees, 68 of them, two -third of them were, uh, were the religious extremists. Some of them are involved in uh, uh, manufacturing, the, uh, making passport, ICs, and foreigners. As it is now, as of today, there are 45 of them under ISA. Of the 45, 18 are Malaysians, 27 are foreigners. And uh, out of this, human trafficking, 31 of them are involved in human trafficking. Babies, illegal workers, prostitutes, and all that. And the rest are all dealing with uh, terrorist, terrorist cases, about 14 of them. Now, I always ask, ask one, I always think of this, this question. Those days, but if you were the big alone, the big time alone, drug warlords, drug lords, uh, uh, drug dealers, big time drug dealers, when they are detained, only the lawyers will come because we believe in law and therefore the test is wrong. The society, I'm quite doubtful, a lot of people will complain. No one come to stick their neck out for big time alone, drug uh, dealers, or those involved in heinous crime. And by the way, I, I, must, I must stress here, I'm not trying to justify that the police uh, should abuse the power or, or the police should use it as, a, as, as an excuse for not doing their own. That's not, that's not the case. But the fundamental question remains whether we should have, a pre, we should have some form of preventive law in this country and to deal with extremism and to deal with people who are not peace. That, that's that's at least my question as well. Thanks, Raiki. Harris, it seems that uh, BN has discarded their, 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 their history of basically locking up people for political purposes under the ISA, and now they're saying that basically we want to do it for security only, you know, in instances where it's preventive. You know, for instance, we know this guy is bad, we want to lock him up because he's going he's to pose a threat. Is that acceptable? I'll start by saying I think we are marking up the wrong tree. Um, if I can quickly just go back to the ISA. 1960, in its inception, it had built into it the right to apply for habeas corpus. Now, that's fundamental. And, uh, Senator, you say that, you know, if you look at other jurisdictions, this is the norm. We have that. But the BN administration under Mahade, surreptitiously removed it. Alright? Now, that in itself is an indicator as to the, the uh, mindset that the Ruling authority brings is dealing with its powers under the ISA. If, if you see it fit to remove a, a, uh, a facility within the act that allows a detainee to bring this matter before the High Court to say, look, um, scrutinize and see whether my detention is legitimate. Now, that's a default. And this is why I say we're backing up the wrong tree. The problem is not with the law. The problems with an authority that has shown again and again its willingness to abuse the law. And I'll give you a simple example. 2008 September, Sinju reported was detained under the ISK, ostensibly as explained by the Home Minister then, for her own protection. Now, that's a wanted abuse of the ISA. 2000 to 2003, scores of civil servants, scores of civilians who became under the ISA for being involved in the issuance of ICs in Sabah. Why? 
Why was that the case? Why were they not presented to court in charge? And I'm suggesting that the reason for this is this. If they had been called up to court, big names would have been exposed right to the very top. Now that's an increase of power. You talk about animals and gangsters and drug dealers being detained in, in Simpan Ranga. Same reason, if they were all to court, big names would be disclosed. Now this is a wanton abuse of power. My point therefore is you can go on changing the laws, but if there is not within the authority of the day a recognition that powers are given for legitimate use, you can go on singing to the cows come home, these abuses are going to go on. Look, look at the Security Offences Act. I would have thought, I, would, I agree with you, Senator, a legitimate authority requires some limited preemptive powers. But what you do then is you build into the act checks and balances. For example, if you're going to detain a man for seven days to ensure he's not being tortured, Provision really before a medical officer every morning. Provision before a high court judge every two days. So he can ask him, are you being fair? Are you being given enough time to see? Nothing of the sort. The, the, the judicial powers of the session court judge under the Security of Fair Offenses Act have been largely curtailed. No curial powers. If it's an application by a prosecutor, he or she shall go back and read the act. You can ask more questions in the Q&A later, which we'll be having in 20 minutes. So we'll move on for now. I want, I want to talk about voting. So Harish, what do you think? More than a million Malaysians have left the country since the independence, ostensibly to look for better shores abroad, you know, better prospects. Should these people who have turned their back on the country have the right to vote? Who turned whose back on who? I mean, this nation turned its back on them. We have... We have since the 70s, early 70s, split this nation into two. Bumi Putra, non Bumi Putra. This is a nation of a single people. And if you tell a people you are second class citizen, why should they show loyalty to this country? Now I don't fault a man who is treated second to someone who says, Sayyid Yahya is me. I beg your pardon. My great grandfather came here and built a bridge in Nibukdaba. He came well before Najib's four fathers. But he's not a Bumi Putra. So, back to your question, people who turn their back. The Constitution says if you're a citizen and if you do not suffer any of the legal impediments, you have a right to vote. And that is the singular power given to the citizen to decide the fate of this nation. Now, EC is now saying, okay, we'll give it to you. The next time I come back once in five years. That's not in the Constitution. The EC is I not in the Constitution. Guys, we have Prof. Dr. Ajit Bari. Joining us on stage.
And you have, you have cases like, in, for example, like Singapore, 400,000 Malaysians working there. If they want to all vote in Singapore, how are we going to deal with it? I'm not saying that it cannot be done. It can be done. But the cost involved is formidable. And it could be uh, very uh, difficult to handle. And I, I, I understand some political parties also disagree, but I pass the youth just to give a statement saying that it's very, uh, do I agree with that because of certain reasons. Unless you can do it in terms of, in the form of online voting, and we have not reached that stage, online voting probably is workable. Uh, I think India has had tried that, but it, it, it became a nightmare for them after that. So, but to do online voting, then the question of credibility, integrity, the question is again, easy the question is again. And uh, some, uh, some constituency, because uh, the marginal constituency probably make a difference between the 50 or 100 votes. Then let's say the, the, the outcome of elections from one particular constituency is because of some voters in Pulau Pago, as I said. And the question of whether these voter votes are tainted, gerrymandered, and all that. So, it, to me, it's a more, it's a terrible, it, it is a very difficult logistic problem to deal with and operational problem. But in principle, it's nothing to stop people from voting. So, the reason we don't do it is because of cost. Basically. Okay, Tan Sri. In your opinion, this is the logistic problem. I, 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 just, I, I just think, for example, like in the UK, most of you are from UK. If you want to have it, have it in the London Embassy, or you want to do it in Manchester, Cardiff, Nottingham, and all the places, and that's only in the UK. I'm talking about another 400,000 people working in Singapore. So, how would they do this? I think there's no way I'm fast about this, but the logistic problem has to be dealt with, but in principle it's nothing against the against mercy voting. Okay, that's great. Um, in your 30 years in the diplomatic service, as I understand it, diplomats, wherever they go around the world, they can vote. This is correct? In your 30 years in the diplomatic service, wherever you go in the world, you can still vote, right? You vote by postal votes. So do um, army personnel stationed abroad, as well as government officers. So do you think that this is really the case, what Whitey described? That basically it's, a, it's an impossible logistical nightmare to get everybody to work? Yeah, 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 I mean, the, the postal ballot is too late for the first time in the future, but we did vote, yeah? So, postal voting is one way. Uh, uh, E-line voting, we need to keep that normally. Online voting, we can run properly without the temper, you know? Uh, I think it's what we are. Uh, I think it's the right. It's the right conditions to vote. Whether they want to vote or not, it's a good measure. Right? Even some person in the country will vote sometimes, you know? But this is a good measure, it's a choice. But the right should be given. And I think uh, that uh, we have to be found uh, in places where it's a range. Uh, I think we should uh, arrange for any man to the others to work at the centers. But unless the human race of the inside, right, through postal voting in advance, we should be arranged. And you know, when the well, 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 time when well, the should be in place, a uh, month before, two weeks before, we could vote. Uh, I think that would be uh, as well. So I think that it's a right that I think it's all kind of a good question. Hi, as I understand it, Singaporeans uh, abroad uh, can still vote, and there are many Singaporeans that travel all, all across the world. Obviously, their population is much smaller, credit to what we, their population is much smaller than us, they're 5 million Singaporeans versus, you know, 28 million Indonesians and, you know, almost 2 million that have traveled abroad. Uh, but for a government that has a 5% deficit, to say that cost of voting abroad, is that dependable? What do you think? Okay. Um, if we stop rearing cows and bundles, <laughs> and if we stop buying submarines that won't sink, Is going to be an issue. But now let's go to the heart. The problem here 
is a total loss of confidence in institutions of state. What I say is, you mentioned online voting or e-voting. If we have total confidence in the impartiality, in the integrity of the election commission, e-voting, online voting could be done from anywhere in the world at practically no cost because we have no doubt that the EC would administer that through to its duty under the Constitution at no cost. But the reality is this, as, as uh, Senator has said, Pass has said, we are not going to accept postal voting because we don't trust them. We don't trust that it will be administered in the spirit in which it is supposed to be done. So, Senator, uh, Mr. Moderator, this is an oil producing country. Since 1974, statistics suggest that two to three trillion have passed through federal coffers. Um, I don't think, I don't think you can displace a constitutional right to determine the direction of this country on this fallacious argument that we ain't got no money. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's gone to thousands of condos. I think everybody knows which side of the fence Harris is on now. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, uh, just a quick question to you. Uh, per se, basically they're fighting for electoral reforms, right? Um, do you feel, how, how does it come in when, when per se goes out to the street for a day, the, you know, the allegations people go and, you know, they, they shake their bottom uh, outside houses and they demonstrate and they say that basically, uh, you know, you're depriving us of our livelihood. So, you have to balance two rights. Now, how do you feel this balance should be administered? And are we doing the balance right? Now, uh, that is uh, <coughs> a matter for the authority of police to decide. But uh, going to, uh, let's say, let's say two and let's say three, I think, uh, I think what we probably have seen is uh, the police simply uh, failed to strike balance between the two. That is, uh, the exercise of the different right of the citizens to, to assemble peacefully, and they are part to uh, make sure that this doesn't, doesn't come into conflict with uh, public order, which I, I think, given what happened, uh, what we have seen is that uh, even before the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the participant actually uh, uh, do something that is uh, 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 I think it's not because I think the police have already uh, uh, taken something which I think sometimes uh, something that provoked them to, to act. So in the question of uh, I mean and, and of course here is uh, to me also it's pretty uh, clear that there is a kind of selective uh, uh, let's say uh, implementation of, of, of force because uh, there are occasions whereby you, you see people who you know go out and protest and do all sorts of things. But some of the police do anything like Islam is, uh, or is in the or in the neck or in some, some uh, places like that as well. So you see again in, 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 in here, where the protest is uh, obviously uh, aimed at the uh, ruling behind, then the police uh, take a swift action against uh, the, the, the participant. But when it comes to uh, those who somehow you know, who are acting against the Pakatan government of Pakatan, administration, you don't see that, 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 that swift action by the police. So here is the question of, uh, I think the, the authorities, especially the police, fail to exercise uh, the state on their part. And I think they have seen uh, all the places, I think, uh, but very unfortunate to see that uh, they, have, they have not learned anything from it. Uh, but uh, if you compare this per se with more recent uh, uh, certainly, like um, in Punani Jawi and other stuff a month ago, you can see the order and the, the peaceful nature of this, this gathering. And I think when, when you can see that, you can see that if the police do anything about it, or just let it go, I think if somehow the students know how to exercise this thing and so on and make sure that the gathering wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, interfere with public order. Uh, Why you, you, you made some waves uh, 
earlier last year when you criticized the Home Ministry's decision to censor the economist. You know, you basically spoke out about how counterproductive it is and you know, a waste of time it is in, in a society where you can go online and read the actual version. Now, given that you've spoken so clearly and you know, clairvoyantly about freedom of press, about basically being able to get your message across and, and making the case against them as well, using figures you know, and statistics rather than censoring, how can you defend ownership of the Star and ownership of Kutusan and all major newspapers by political parties, major political parties that are in government, as well as the requirement to license them year in, year out? Okay, uh, the licensing part of the so as we dealt with. Uh, the ownership, okay, let's just start. It all depends on the editorial's independence. Are you, are you, unless you are urging that MCA every day, day, day out, send out people there, go and monitor what they are doing. That's not the case. After all, Star is probably the company. So the shareholders, we have different shareholders. We are not 100% shareholders. We are not even 50% shareholders. We are majority, one of the majority shareholders. So the ownership itself shouldn't be seen to be uh, interfering with the editorial board. I think what, what can you say is you read on the news side whether it has been reported fairly and in a bad manner. And that's something subject to the criticism. That all that all media to say. We will go on online media. I think some of the online media, whatever I said, this has been a very selectively reported. I also have some grievances. But it's beside the point. I suppose as long as I have a platform and I can express my point of view and it's reported on your channel, I think that there should be Can we have someone from the right? Yeah, my name is Paul. I 
and a PhD student from UTM. My question is, as a democratic country, is any possible our Malaysia or the politics to be integrated and to be united as a multiracial party? Let us look forward for the Vision 2020 because we already look far and spend too much time on the election issue. This will jeopardize our country's economy, especially we are far behind on the other Southeast Asia country like the Indonesia, okay. Thailand and Korea. Thanks, Wong. Wong, is your question directed to anybody in particular? Uh, I would like those uh, involved with the politics or the human rights. You've described everybody. <laughs> Get to the point because we need to we need to get as many questions as possible. Then the Daniels on Article uh, 103. Can we have YB and Prof? If that's okay. And Paul's question will do it. Right. There's tons of questions I will ask you. Now I'm a I'm a I'm a liberal I'm a liberal person. I will see that uh, anything behind four walls. You know, in the old rules, what I do, it's not to harm people. It's, to me, I suppose, there's a will, you know, there's a choice, there's a will, right? But, it, but there, there is, but there is a difference. Some people may feel really offended. But there's a difference between your way of life, uh, let's say, how it's, it doesn't like my face. As if I should still be, you don't like my face. And uh, you feel offended and when I see my face. That's one thing. That, that is his problem. But when he doesn't like my face, he beat the shit out of me, and that's harming me. So there's a difference between feeling offended and being harmed. So, in what category this case is marriage fall into? You, is the start is all harmed, damaged, or it is just very personal? Behind the room, is it inside the room, so you do what you want, so as long as you don't harm other people. I, I must say, I have no answer for this. It's very sorry, I have no answer for this. Um, Sex marriage, I do not see the nearby foreseeable future, given our social, our social, uh, uh, our political and social culture in this country, and especially with the different religious belief, it could be quite difficult. Harris? Yes, they are excited to can get the MCA to move a private member's bill. I will try to generate support from civil society. So the bucks to that. Now, uh, very quickly, my religious upbringing uh, teaches me that uh, man wears a woman. But it also teaches me that I must respect the choice and space of the next individual. So on that one thing, I will support any individual. It may run contrary to my religious uh, notions. But my religious, my religious teaching also teaches me that I must champion the next person's right to choose his way of life. Okay, thanks. Do I need another question because it's directed at you? Uh, there is questions on 153. Put this thing, uh, this is the same design. Oh, the one. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now, 153, I always believe this. 153, let's say we talk about quota system. If something, some say it's very sensitive, it should be there or the rest is there. In fact, it wasn't in 1957 constitution. Even in 1948, it was already there. It was already there in 1948, it was just very forward. It was during the, uh, the developments of the, during the uh, nation building process, and before independence, there were arguments whether we should keep that or we should keep that out. So it was carried forward. But what I, what I think the grievance should be this. That provision is there, as I said earlier on, it's about reasonable proportion. That reasonable proportion is serves a purpose. The purpose is for positive affirmative actions to assist the marginalized group. And it happens to be, by in that, in 1957, probably the economic power of the uh, of Malaysia uh, Malay land is probably less than two percent is in the uh, is in the uh, Malay land those days. So it was there to serve a purpose. But as I said, what is reasonable proportion if Changes from time to time. If you cannot maintain 30% all the time, you cannot give a discount and uh, maintain 30% for, for the rich people. It doesn't make sense. 
That provision is to help the needy and the marginalized and the underprivileged people. So if you happen to be in that category, you should, you should help. So that's the reason why the present administration's budget came up. Firstly, they abolished the, uh, the liberalized the service sectors, abolished the 30 percent quota for this for, for listing purpose, for public this company. Why? Because you are so you are so the first, you are so rich. The government is no reason this government should help you when you're so rich. Well, only they were there to help support the people. Then, in throughout the world, there's such thing called social engineering. And it is government's job to do social engineering. But that social engineering must be implemented in a reasonable manner. That, that's the best answer. So, has Article 1.3 updated its usefulness? Yes or no? <laughs> Article 1.3, uh, the special positions, I would say yes, I'll read it at the entire. Whereas, it's, again, it's implementation, where we get the balance correct as to the reasonable proportion. We should only take a take a At the one time, during my time, for example, the scholarship. Scholarship probably get about, uh, don't, not only to about less than 10 cents, 5 cents. This is most you get now, those doses. But now it's almost 40 cents, even for Chinese. So there's a formula of merit, social disadvantage, and uh, ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic uh, quota. So this formula can be changed any other time. It's just gradually changing. It was from those days without merit at all. Then we are now 20, 30, now 40% of merits. And then another 40% are in the uh, ethnic quota. And then another 20, 20% for, for, the, uh, for the social uh, disadvantage. So this formula, I, I agree, it may come a time where you probably can touch it when everyone is on level playing field. But that is not today. There are still, you, you want to make comparisons. Okay. Uh, perhaps I just give one comparison. You're, you live in the TGDI. And your SPM is about 9 A, sorry, it's 8 A's, not nice, not nice, it is 8 A's. And you compare someone in the Kalinga, uh, in the Sabah. Indigenous people, schools, free rotten, no Wi Fi, nothing, no tuitions, nothing, and it gets 5 A's. Should we give them an opportunity to just sort of offer them a place in the university? Yeah. Bro? So I think I, I'm not sure if I find the position of the council, shall we try? To me, it's really the, the guides for everybody from the government and the system alike. So there's no question of whether the constitution uh, serves us or we should count out the constitution. As for the uh, 153, I think the provisions are clear, it's very flexible. And to the question whether it is a related purpose, uh, perhaps we should uh, bear in mind uh, what the the Commission itself has recommended way back in 1957 that it should be reviewed uh, 15 years after independence. And uh, during the negotiation, even the people themselves have expressed a kind of reservation about creating this uh, special position because uh, it is obviously against the notion of equality. And uh, the problem with this uh, 153 is that it does not define what it means by special position. And of course, this, uh, the problem now is when we have a situation whereby things like, or the policies like uh, NEP has been put above the constitution. So people seem to forget the constitution and remember that it is not actually the constitution. Okay. Okay, uh, folks, question. That's sweet. Can we have an outside this point of view? What do you think? Do you think Malaysia will move towards a stage where we will have just the multiracial parties and no parties segmented by race? Well, I think that's the, the goal of all of us. Uh, when you look, at, uh, look back at the history, the first uh, president, the first president, the first president of the Civil Defense, which is one of the Japan, uh, was not cited. Uh, if the country would be completely different, right? if it continued to be the present of law and we become first time in Malaysia, but uh, there was not to be, and the country took the direction, I think we should return to that, to that first vision we had. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's pretty big. Uh, what we have in the country is segmentation. When I was in school, there was not much, you know, integration between students are not And I, I thought it was a mistake for so long as a desert to go back. I, I thought the country is, is moving pressure. Integration of when I came back from time to time, I was dismayed to find out that things are different. So I asked myself, what's happened? 
Tehát egy kezdődik most a procesztor a szisztelt. Tehát van egy kapcsolat, egy kicsit Ez a része, egy kapcsolat, csomó külső rajta. Ez a része. A leaders, orders, leaders, leaders, multi-tekkes egyre. Vagy a különböző formulation answers. Tehát a most, hogy a thought flow, You know, the, the implications of Malaysia. Uh, I think they kind of import or exporting our kind of things to East Malaysia. It's a lot of But I think it's so different that, you know. So I think uh, politicians uh, and all of us have to think very seriously about it. I think that's the way to go. Uh, a non, non-ethnic based kind of political system. That's a good way. Uh, and I think that's a long-term goal. But I think it's been up. Uh, we hope to go uh, to become uh, what we call the country by 2030. It's eight years from now. And until and unless we, are, we put our whole house in order, many of these national conventions or instruments of rights uh, will not be ratified by us or to Forget what education is, silent. Silent. We have to accede to it. There are nine, as you know, we have done with three women, children, and recently these things with reservations. You know, what the are there? Because of uh, the way, you know, our study is organized, some issues are sensitive. Uh, there are six outstanding, not that. When I was on the stream, we, we, we pushed, you know, we still pushed, but not as, as big as before. Uh, to the extent that I, I find a bit disappointed that the government is not pushing very hard on, on, on the government, uh, assuming to the remaining seats. Uh, can you imagine that in 2020, when the Prime Minister of Malaysia and whoever that person will be, uh, goes to international conference on human rights, he or she will not be able to see very much, although Malaysia is a developed country, which are not by 2020, simply because we have the uh, packages in this. Uh, we will, you know, by the time where before, uh, if not all, most of these instruments seem to be dropped. You know, if you look at the list, we are uh, among the last 15 or so countries in the world uh, who have only ratified two or three. We have done three. Uh, we have only asked Singapore, but then two, Bruna and two. I was one of the three, I challenged them now to do a list of the two. But I came back and have done our three, so we are on the path. And I wouldn't be surprised they will go ahead with us because the change in Myanmar. We have to push very quickly. But when we engage the the, the, the young traders, we do the same argument. You know, our complex country, very special uh, case. You know? And uh, we have to put our hearts in order to change the laws, but not before we, 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 go, we jump on the dragon of extreme to uh, instruments of human rights. But this argument has been the last few years. We have not both. So this is our line I understand. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, can we have someone from the back, the last line? Next question to Senator Gan. Now, as part of my job, um, part one of my duties is to basically visit ISC detainees and what I've seen from you know, the expressions on their faces from the people I've talked to because just two weeks ago I actually spoke to the wife of uh, Mr. Razali Hassan uh, Razali Hassan is an ISC detainee um, He was on a hunger strike for a number of days but he abandoned this due to uh, protection of hepatitis B and due to fighting health Now, when I spoke to his wife I saw the tears that were in her eyes. I saw that she wanted very badly for her husband to come back to her, to eventually come back and rear the family the way he was meant to be. But when asked as to the grounds of why he was detained, basically the wife, the wife responded that he was detained simply because he was um, he housed a friend who was involved in arms dealing. He wasn't actually involved in arms dealing. The government had no shred of evidence to um, say that he was involved in arms dealing, and that is what the ISA is all about. Now, I think it is a draconian act, but as you mentioned earlier during your speech, that implementation of such an act is necessary in order to ensure the continued security of this country, to protect this country from undivided elements that would damage our democracy, our safety, towards the, um, our safety within this country, within this cultural framework. Now, I would like to quote a tweet from somebody who is responsible for this. Um, by Fisher Willie, page 2.0. Sorry, hunger strike? Sorry. Is there, is there a question in there? Because yes, there is. There is. So, can we get to it? Sure. 
hunger strike till han breaker lamb chop till han aku. What is your comment on this? Can we have that again, please? He shuffled his two o right. Um, he, in reference to the hunger strike that they went through. Um, hunger strike till han breaker lamb chop till han aku. What do you say about this gross negligence towards their right? Okay, can we have someone from the back on the right? Hello? Okay, a very good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Charmaine. I just finished my A-levels in College of Hidapa. Uh, recently, I had a discussion with a few friends regarding Article 153. Uh, one of them who is a Sumi told me that he feels that without quotas and reserve plans, things like that, uh, he feels that it would be very hard for them to compete with other races who might be, you know, more Gyasu. So, my question is, um, as a Bumi of anyone among you, uh, do you think that Article 153 will continue to temper the Bumi, or will this make them even more complacent? Thank you. Who is this question directed to? Uh, anyone? Okay. And can we have someone again from the front here? Alright, thank you. Uh, I'm Mika Eroski from College of and UEM. I have a question open to all delegates and uh, more directly to Mr. Harris and Uh The rhetoric and popular sentiment is exciting, but the denial of the current fiscal position is irresponsible. So let's not talk about corruption. Malaysia has a debt to GDP ratio of 53%. We have an internal fiscal rule of 55%, so you can see how close that is. And we have never obtained a budget surplus for 15 years. My question is, can nations truly afford to be fiscally irresponsible to let these people go? And I hope not to hear, uh, let's change this rule, because we've seen Greece and it doesn't work out. And hopefully, Ms. Harris can Sorry, what was your name again? Uh, Mikhail Rosen. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's start with the last question. Can we have one the one about the ICT means. Uh, a few years back, in this dollar warned us that if we did not cut down on our subsidies, uh, we face this bleak possibility of uh, a nation bankrupt uh, either 2017 or 2019. Um, his, his predictions or warnings have actually been uh, surpassed by the speculation of international financial analysts to suggest that that disaster is closer in point of time. Uh, this might be good. At this juncture, in terms of our standing, in terms of our standing, we are two points or two places removed from internationally categorized as our bonds, government bonds being junk bond status. Right? Um, I was in a group of uh, of uh, Activists the other day seriously looking at this concern. Then the suggestion was this: the suggestion was this that perhaps Pakistan should not even look to take the federal government uh, during the 13th general election, lest they face a similar situation confronted by the Liberal Democrat, the Lib Dem in the UK, who inherited a government that was so ill, a nation that was so ill that they could not undo it. All right. And this is, this is something I think we are confronted with. We are confronted with this reality. We have a government that is in denial. Um, the question of amending fiscal policies in order to accommodate this, uh, the, 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 the level of debt uh, doesn't arise. Um, really, I think this is, this is a concern that's not been sufficiently spoken about today. Are we, as a nation, facing bankruptcy. I don't have the answer. But it is something that is of serious concern. This is something that we are trying to share with the party and budget in the kampong because they think everything is hunky dory. But it is a serious problem. Many of us don't have the answer. Okay, right. So you share Mika's concern and we already spend 700 million every year on the EC. So considering our precarious finances, can we afford to spend even more money? Can we afford not to? Really, because the reality is this, 
um, you, you take this position, and I think this, this puts in us face the situation really. 1970, you went to Singapore, our ringgit then was the ringgit, it was the dollar. And that one nation dollar was equivalent to Singapore one ten. Today, it is the reverse. Singapore one dollar, 250 Malaysian ringgit. Now, Singapore doesn't have oil, doesn't have gas, doesn't have rubber, doesn't have oil pump, doesn't have timber. They buy our water and they steal our sand. <laughs> but their economy has gone up while ours is near the cesspool. Alright? Um, who, do you, who do you pin this on? This is, this is in, in, in essence, we have been taken here by a regime that once it pushed Dasa economy value and once it tells the Malays that Amno defends the Hak Istimewa of Melayu, just remind you, Malays in Singapore do not have to put the status. Malays in Singapore do not have Hak Istimewa of Melayu, but they earn more than the average Malay here. The reality, my friends, if we don't use our resources to take root, to see a, to see a regime change in, we are facing bankruptcy. We need to spend the money. Now, it's unfortunate that uh, people now think uh, the 153 in terms of quota, which I think is not really the case because, uh, but somehow uh, we got to remember that over the years amendments have been made to, to 153, and some of them, I, I believe, is are quite uh, against the original intention of creating 153 itself. Because if you look at clause 1, which I think set the tone of the entire provisions, is that uh, this uh, safeguarding or protecting the position of special disability must be done in such a way that it, 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 it does not conflict with the legitimate interests of other communities. So, I'm not sure that this quota thing um, actually is actually 153. I, I don't think it's, it's a case of quota. Now, whether or not we should, we should continue with it, I, I think uh, uh, we have to remember, we have to realize that uh, doing away with it, abolishing it, is, is, is simply out of question because of the difficulty of getting to the majority and uh, one has to remember that we've got to the consent uh, of Commons of Owners to, to amend it. But I think what we can do about it is to, to change the way we, we, we look at it in demand. But perhaps uh, I think we should also remember that uh, I don't think that can happen under this present regime. So we've got to change and perhaps uh, see how other, other parties can, can do that. Because I think uh, if we look at 153 plus 1, it's very flexible and it's not really giving the Malays necessarily the, the help or the crutches or whatever. And I think after more than 50 years, it has failed. And you look at the original scheme designed by the Commission was that it was basically meant for just the first 15 years. Now we have gone more than 50 years, so I think we've got, we got to, to, to look at it. Why uh, about the fishing business? Um, the the land shop, I mean. <laughs> I, I would say, if, if that were true, I, I think that's inappropriate. That's a great lack of, it's quite careless. Kind of way of approaching it. I wouldn't say things like that. Okay, but I think, uh, can you share a response to some of the physical policy topics? I just briefly, quickly, please. Now, as you see, physical policy, the, the problem with, with this country, I think, because some of the doctor was asking questions about too much politics in our country now. But maybe this is the necessary process we have to go through. And uh, it, is, it, may not be necessary, it, it may not necessarily be a bad thing, but the problem with politicians in our place, play to the gallery. Complete powerless, uh, complete powerless in uh, playing to the gallery, is talking, but zero commitment in the works that you should do. You know, want to pass it off is easy, but at the end of the day, you still have to do it. And of course, it's a position that are not really going because they're not in power, so they don't have to deliver. That's very fine. But at least please come up with clear policy and how you want to deliver if you were in government. So, uh, as to the question about the, uh, the deficit, so the measurement of deficit actually, uh, for the last three years, our deficit is coming down from 6% to 5%, and we have confidence to bring down to 4.6%, and probably by next year, 4.5%. 
So this is the, uh, the national health in terms of fiscal policy is measured by the percentage of uh, percentage of deficit. Uh, this is different arguments uh, whether three percent is healthy, four percent, eight percent is green, uh, is yellow light, ten percent is at the verge of bankruptcy and all that. So all these different arguments I think you can make yourself and if you if you want to get access to these formations, read the uh, this Jala's arguments about the current policies. And all these are I suppose are like, uh, false signs. But the things that I'm very worried because of the populist approach by both political right, especially the opposition and the ruling party, you promise to abolish the DPTA, which will cost the government 43 billion. You promise to abolish all the toll, turn over tolls, uh, concessions. You promise to ensure all the families have minimum income of 4,000. We have that kind of rough calculation. Within two years, this country will go back up, including that. Or we know. Even if Pakistan becomes the power, they will not do it. Because they know that they, all they need to say is play the, play the battery. This is an ill, this is inherited, a corrupt uh, government, and we, there's no way to do it. That's the typical political speech here. Okay. Please come with the substance, what you, how you want to achieve it. Do play the battery, it's very happy. Yeah, I would like to be a Santa Claus. And uh, I like to be a, but Santa Claus is like, I like to be a good Samaritan, but good Samaritan is to have money for that. Thanks, Eric. Okay, I think we have time for a last set of three questions, but very brief. Okay, so can we have one from the front here? Minister Gan Tongxiu. Both your yeah. minister in NTA have admitted that leakages and corruption cases cost us 26 billion ringgit annually in Indonesia during the debate between Chief Minister Lin Guan Ying and Dasui Chasanet. My question is, why is it no action taken by the MACC department against those sharks? to shut up our money. And even worse, there are officers in MSCC that caught receiving bribes from people, which is a huge embarrassment to the government. So it, is this meant by transform transformation program from a corrupted country to a more corrupted country? Thank you. Okay. Uh, one last question. We have time for one last question. So can we have uh, middle of that room. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. Um, my name is Wan Hilmi. I'm doing law in the law, University of Malaya. So, uh, Professor, my question is on fundamental liberties in the federal constitution, that is, Article 5 to Article 12. Uh, as we all know, the freedom. In our country, it's not absolute as it is limited. That's why it is called fundamental liberties and not fundamental rights. Uh, however, do you think these limitations are necessary as the limitations often result in the fundamental liberties are prevented from being exercised? So my question is, do you think it would be a good idea to make some amendments to the federal constitution by remove, removing the limitations and replace them with a provision which reminds the citizens to exercise their freedom of speech, association, etc., etc., with responsibilities and with due regards of the rights of the others. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can we have a few questions, please? So, but I think it's not a big problem because uh, I don't I don't think the people or those those who have complained about it actually asking for uh, complete un unconditional freedom. What they ask is just <coughs> what is reasonable, what is common in all democracies, such as right to assemble, right to freedom of the express themselves, and right to free to perform their society. So. I, I don't see the need to, to amend the constitution because for one thing it is now it's almost impossible to amend it because no one has got the required majority to do that. So what we need to do is, is to go back to the provision and see what actually is meant or uh, 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 envisioned by, by that. So it's not really amendment but to, to apply a different set of, of of perspective into it, because at the moment I think 
we put too much uh, concern at the position, something which I, I think, uh, unfortunately, is not, uh, not uh, allowed or not even designed uh, by the Commission itself. So just go back to the Constitution and try to, 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 to allow it uh, to, 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 to happen and just to allow the, the citizens to exercise what the right that they have under the Constitution. So I think what we have got between, uh, uh, from Article 5 to 13, I think are good enough and they can be extended by the courts. Okay, thanks. Uh, just uh, uh, that the Sri Lanka's Right. Uh, since I don't know how it gets here, but I think there is an always an uh, index survey to do an estimate how much leakages by way of inefficiency and the corruptions that causes the government and lose our uh, lose our national resources on that. But I must say, finding corruption is a two-way process. It is not easy. That's why I just put it as one of the NGRA major major books to deal with. But I must say it's not been extremely successful, no, not, not really. It takes to the table to begin with, but not really the private sectors or individuals are involved. Even the private sectors, corruptions are, are going on as well. And you know, those who are involved in procurements and all that, uh, procurement officers, they get kicked back and all that. So what the government does now is, first, you set a KPI, it's easiest. If you are being preached to you, you must be uh, uh, upright, don't take, uh, don't take uh, bribery and all that, it's easy to preach. But the easier one to do now is setting KPI. Cut down the, the, the turnaround time. Corruption is on the ground when a lot of unnecessary delay. And uh, the turnaround time is too long so for some poor process. Now we all set it. Say within seven days, you have to answer. Within two, two weeks, within three weeks, within one month, or within three days. When the turnaround time is much faster, the chances of breeding the corruption is so much lesser. And other than that, uh, you can see that the government, out of all the government procurement, uh, Contracts requires the suppliers to or the contracting parties to sign the integrity pledge. Having signed it doesn't mean that you, you, you will ensure there will be no corruptions, but that's what government is trying to do. And of course, the other thing is the government's involvement in economy. So I, I can see that the government transformation plan is, especially in the economic transformation plan, is to list all the JLC. Listing of JLC, make it market oriented. Market orientated and make it more efficient and effective, and therefore the leakage to become lesser. So, that, that, these are some of the approaches that government is taking now. But I must say, it takes to the table. Hopefully, we all are not involved. And uh, there's no one giving, there's no one receiving. But I, I, I can understand why people want to give. Sometimes, and, uh, you're, you're stopped by police, you know, you know you're, you're a you're supposed to take a parking, uh, you're supposed to take a, a, a summons and you want. So, you know, this tendency, inclination to pay another 20 bucks and one coin pay. Now, this is something that we all must avoid. Please do not do it. Once you start doing it, it's endless. And once once begins to do once, then gradually you will let your protect to do a lot more because you need to compromise your own integrity. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you for a wonderful session. And to round up, I'm going to ask one question and I just want yes no answers from all four of you. Okay. Which uh, I mean, considering how proposed everybody's been, it's really difficult. Like, no, but try to restrain yourself. Do you think that we will respect civil liberties enough that one day we will live in a Malaysia where bumps up and our government columns in all our forms that they're currently printed on will no longer be there? We will respect civil liberties enough, equality, non discrimination, for instance, that one day we will live in a Malaysia where the words Bangster and Agama will no longer be on any form. Yes. Why do we come to one day we will reach destination? Sorry, this is not this is not a no, 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 this is a really question. I didn't answer the yes or no answer. But we must see what are the calls to serve what purpose. To serve our purpose. I'm a Chinese, I, I feel that like I'm a Chinese, I'm a Chinese. No matter how this country is developed, I'm still Chinese. But I'm a Malaysian. Chinese is my ethnic identity. That's all. That's all the service. The purpose is service that. And uh, I write, if I'm a Buddhist, if I write Buddhist, that shows that my uh, religion is that. But what purpose does this serve? If it's purpose to use that for discrimination process, then so.
Let's read. Well, I'm the oldest here. <laughs> uh, before, I used to think it's something different. But I think uh, for this to you and also uh, other young people that uh, function as an I hope it will become a reality. And it's even better, although it's important to say that it's, uh, it's got a substantial reality, so that, you know. So, uh, maybe 2020 is too soon, but uh, hopefully, you know, we've got more customers to do with this, uh, uh, what labels we do. The last 10 years when I've encountered these polls that have all these requirements, race, I've answered irrelevant, uh, religion, I've answered irrelevant, and sex, I've said yes, please. <laughs> uh, it's not going to happen until we cross that. We, we will have to drive this government to abandon all these nonsensical questions. Until that, it won't happen. Okay, thank you everybody for a wonderful session. Uh, we'll wrap this up now.